Welcome everyone to the PlayStation 1 Iceberg Chart Explanation video. Now there are a lot of PlayStation Icebergs out there, but I found this one to be the best. Really quick, I'm going to ask you to comment below what you think about these entries, whether it's your favorite entry, something you had no clue existed, or something else fun that I didn't cover in the video. I really want to hear from you guys. With that all said, let's get straight into U slash South Park Simpsons 90s Iceberg. We'll be kicking off Tier 1 with the Sony Nintendo deal. While this topic has been covered numerous times on YouTube, I'll give an extremely brief explanation of what the Sony Nintendo deal was and the implications it had on the gaming world. It began when Ken Kutaragi, who worked at Sony, reached out to Nintendo to make a CD-ROM add-on to the Super Nintendo. Kutaragi, who would later become one of the most influential people in gaming history, the father of the PlayStation, believed that CD-based games were the future, though Sony didn't care much about getting into the gaming world at the time. In 1988, Nintendo and Sony managed to create an agreement where Sony would develop the disc-based add-on to the Super Nintendo. However, at some point, Nintendo's president decided he didn't like the contract and established one with Philips instead, which was much more favorable to Nintendo. Sony announced their prototype at the June 1991 Consumer Electronics Show, but the very next day, Nintendo announced their new partnership with Philips. Philips, being a huge rival to Sony, made this just a big middle finger from Nintendo to Sony, and everyone was surprised. The rift between Nintendo and Sony was never repaired, and Sony took what they learned and, and used it to create the PlayStation, which would later become an incredibly successful console. As you can imagine, none of these so-called Nintendo PlayStations would be sold, and prototypes were lost in one way or another. But in 2015, one was discovered which was eventually sold for over 350,000 US dollars. At this time, it's the only prototype known to have survived. Polygon Man was PlayStation's first mascot. Intended to help market the PlayStation to a younger audience, Polygon Man appeared in ads before the PlayStation's launch, though he would eventually be dropped in favor of some more popular characters like Crash Bandicoot. He's also somewhat infamous for an ad he appeared in stating that the PlayStation was more powerful than God. Who thought that ad would be a good idea? You Are Not Ready or You Are Not E was a marketing campaign for the PlayStation telling people that well, essentially, they weren't ready for this powerful console. Some of these ads were really cryptic, however, with the first one ending in the tagline, Enos Lives. E somehow meant ready, and NOS meaning 9th of September, when the PlayStation was to be released. The tagline then became, You Are Not E, or You Are Not Ready. These commercials, while strange, showed off awesome gameplay, and all in all, they contributed to the marketing campaign being excellent and much more aggressive than those of past consoles, which is part of why its sales performed so well. The Pocket Station is a memory card slash peripheral for the PlayStation released exclusively in Japan in 1999. It acted as a memory card, but it had an LCD screen and acted as a clock and personal assistant. Compatible games would allow you to download small mini-games onto the device and play them on the go. It was pretty successful, selling 5 million units, and it actually received some PlayStation 2 support as well. Teyu Goto, who created the original PlayStation controller, cleared up the meaning of the four iconic PlayStation buttons in an interview. The circle and X represent yes and no, the triangle represents point of view, and the square represents a piece of paper intended to be used to access menus. This is pretty interesting, and it's also interesting that the intentions for the X and O buttons were switched in the West. I'm not entirely sure if there's a cultural reason behind that decision, but it's a pretty interesting piece of trivia. The parallel I slash O refers to this port on the PlayStation which Sony created to use for future peripherals. However, Sony themselves wouldn't really create any besides the PlayStation Link cable which was used to play games on multiple consoles. The community, however, saw plenty of use for this port, and used it for a huge amount of third-party devices like action replays. They could also be used to defeat regional lockouts and copy protection, which is part of why Sony removed them on later model iterations. It can also be used for something super cool which we'll learn about later on in this iceberg. The Net Yorose is a PlayStation dev kit. Unlike most dev kits, however, this one was actually sold to the public, intended for people to make their own games. It was pretty expensive, coming in at about 750 US dollars, so it was more geared towards indie studios. 
Sony helped support the game making community with a forum for people to post their games, and they printed news about them in the UK PlayStation magazine, even publishing some demo discs with these games to be sent out in the magazine. This is a super cool instance of a game company connecting with the indie community, and I don't think we've seen anything comparable to this from such a big company since then. These consoles are super hard to come by nowadays, and honestly, the color schemes make them look so much cooler than the original PlayStation, in my opinion. Some PlayStation models can actually play movies. Using video CDs in this unlicensed peripheral, you could play movies on your PlayStation. But exclusively in South Asia, you could buy this video CD PlayStation model which came with built-in support. Being able to play full-length movies on the PlayStation is way ahead of its time, though since VCDs never caught on, it wasn't really popular. The PlayStation Mouse was a peripheral that you could use for a few compatible games. It was mainly used for point-and-click games, but it was also used in place of a light gun for some shooters. It's pretty cool. The T-Rex demo was a short playable demo that came in the disc packaged with original PlayStations, intended to show off some cool features about the PlayStation. He also shows up as a callback in Astro's playroom as a cool boss fight. Petscop is a creepypasta web series shown off in a Let's Play format about finding an unreleased PlayStation game with some sinister features. It's an incredibly compelling story and I highly recommend you check it out. There were a ton of unnecessarily creepy ads for the PlayStation. Just check a few of these out. Stores closed. Not for me, pal. Like to be humiliated by women. Here's your dream date. You are not ready. <sighs> yeah, I don't even know how some of these got the green light. The tradition of creepy ads continued up through the PlayStation 3, only getting somewhat normal around the time of the PlayStation 4. Oh, nope, wait, they're weird here too. Honestly, I don't know why Sony does this, but if it makes it memorable, I guess it worked. $299. So, when I was writing this script, I was like, okay, the price of the PlayStation is $299, I'm not sure why it's on the iceberg. But then I saw this video, which is just hilarious. I'm going to ask Sony Computer Entertainment Presidents of America, Steve Reyes, to join me for a brief presentation. So right before this quote-unquote speech, the Sega Saturn had been announced with a price of $399. Sony's representative, who did have a real speech prepared for E3 1999, just walked up to the microphone and said the price of the PlayStation instead, which was $100 cheaper than the new Sega Saturn. People reacted very positively and it's become an iconic moment in gaming. And you know something funny, this guy has a bunch of papers in his hand and I, I know he improvised the speech, but it would be so funny if on those papers, it was just scribbled in big numbers, 299. The PlayStation 1 Transformer is this super cool Optimus Prime toy that, well, transforms into a PlayStation. He was released alongside this Megatron Sega Genesis, both of which are just awesome. They were released in 2014 for the PlayStation's 20th anniversary. The Polystation refers to knockoff NES systems, also called Famiclones, made to look like original PlayStations. There are tons of these Polystation consoles, and I have no idea why this design in particular is as popular as it is, but it's kind of cool, I guess. PlayStation mod chips are designed to bypass copy protection settings to allow for a myriad of mods to be used. 
This can let you load games from an SD card, play games from any region, and so much more. We'll talk about this a little bit more later on in the iceberg, but the PlayStation made it so easy to install mod chips. This is part of why the PlayStation was one of the easiest consoles to pirate games for. The PS1 Multitap was a peripheral that allowed you to use four PS1 controllers out of one port. Two would let you use up to eight controllers. There's a decent library of games that actually took advantage of this multiplayer, which is super cool. Real PlayStation Mascot I believe this entry refers to just the general question of which one of these characters is the official PlayStation mascot. These guys were all used as mascots at different points, so there really isn't an official answer, but which one is your guys' favorite? Bootleg slash silver discs. Official PlayStation discs have black backsides, while bootleg discs made for modded consoles are usually printed onto normal silver CDs. Oddly enough, some later produced copies of Square Enix games were printed on silver CDs, but in general, discs like this meant you were playing a bootleg. This is Fearful Harmony. Fearful Harmony is an error screen which can occur if you put a damaged or a non-PS1 disc into a modded PlayStation. Its namesake comes from its unsettling yet calming nature. It's part of a series of other error screens which also have similarly poetic names. SCEA and SCEE were acronyms used for the NTSC or PAL discs on PlayStation. Nothing much here besides that, but if you tried to load one of these discs into the game console from the incorrect region, it wouldn't boot up, and the way they checked for this was whether or not A or E was listed at the end of the acronym when you booted up the PlayStation. It's pretty interesting because the PlayStation intro is actually stored on every disc, and it's rendered in real time. So if the PlayStation saw the incorrect letter, it would block the game from starting. Willy the Wombat was a very early name for Crash Bandicoot, who would eventually get his real name and go on to become the little orange PlayStation fellow we know and love today. Ken Kutagari hated Crash Bandicoot. So, for any who weren't aware, Kutagari, the father of PlayStation, absolutely hated the game Crash Bandicoot, mainly because of its appeal to kids. Wanting the PlayStation to be much more mature, he advocated not to make Crash a PlayStation mascot, though eventually Crash would prove to be a character loved by all ages and time. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff! I got a little surprise. PlayStation Underground was a magazine that ran from 1997 to 2001. It was based on these CDs, which you could pop into your PlayStation to play demos and watch trailers. Though it's been gone for quite a while, it was brought back in spirit for this PS5 marketing campaign where London Underground signs were made to look like PlayStation buttons, which is pretty cool. PSX to PSP So I believe this entry is referring to the fact that most PlayStation games can be played on the PSP, which is really neat. If you're interested in trying this, there are plenty of places to look online, but I'll put a link in the description to a pretty good guide from Reddit if you're interested. FIFA Football 2005 was the last licensed PlayStation game to be released in North America. It wasn't just released on the PS1, but a huge random mix of consoles including the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, PC, Xbox, PSP, GameCube, Mobile Phone, Gizmodo, N-Gage, and the GBA. X button pronunciation. So Sony has officially came out and stated that the X button is technically pronounced cross, though most people, including myself obviously, pronounce it as X. But what do you guys call it? 
Mascots Japan Redesign. Okay, so I'm not really sure what this entry is referring to, though I do know that there is a Japanese exclusive mascot that not many people in the West know about, that being Toro Inu, or Sony Cat in English. He's appeared in a couple of games like PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, but again, hasn't been really popular due to his Japan exclusivity. LSD Dream Simulator is quite possibly the strangest and most experimental game released on the PlayStation. Initially made exclusively for Japan and thought up by Japanese artist Osamu Seidu, it's an exploration game inspired by the dream journal of an anonymous employee working at Azmic Ace, the company that developed and published this game. Noted as a playable dream by the company that created it, it's incredibly hard to describe this game without me just showing you gameplay. It's actually something I want to do a full playthrough of sometime, and I encourage you to check it out or emulate it if you have the chance. You play the game in levels called Dreams, which last about 10 minutes each. You can go play these dreams however and whenever you want, and though the environments of them are static, sometimes textures will be swapped, making each playthrough a little bit different. Sado, who conceived the game, viewed the PlayStation as a medium for art, and even made 500 original musical samples for the game. Though it may not hold up today, it's definitely a work of art, and honestly, it seems like one heck of a trip. Playing the PlayStation Upside Down Why, why, why on earth would you want to deliberately turn your game console upside down? Well, for the PS1, it was actually necessary for some people. Apparently, the laser that read the discs could get shifted out of place, and some consoles could only play games when the console was upside down because it moved the laser back. It's a pretty easy fix if you crack open the console, but for a lot of people in the 90s, it was probably much easier just to flip it over. Sega also rejected Sony. Very similarly to the legendary Nintendo deal, or lack thereof, Sony also got rejected to create a console alongside Sega. Tom Kalinske, former CEO of Sega of America, approached the Sega board with two Sony of America representatives to pitch the idea of developing a console together, but the board didn't agree to it. Kalinske would refer to this as the, quote, stupidest decision in all of business, and rightfully so, based on the success we all know that the PlayStation had. Fragile Lasers As many PlayStation owners might unfortunately know, the lasers on these consoles often just stopped working. Hence the flipping the console upside down we just talked about. Like other early consoles playing discs, the optical drive was just fragile, and obviously without the ability to read discs, the console was essentially useless. Black discs have nothing to do with copy protection. So, this is true. The iconic black PlayStation discs aren't black for any anti-piracy reasons, rather just for brand recognition. And hey, here we are, still talking about them so many years later, so clearly they worked as intended. Now, these discs were essentially just regular CDs. If you plugged them into your computer, there weren't any additional protective measures stopping you from pirating games, at least that actually came from the disc being black. The target audience of the PlayStation was much more mature than other consoles. This is a part of why Kutagari hated Crash Bandicoot so much. He wanted the PlayStation to be marketed for adult males of 17 years of age and older. At the time, this was probably to stand out from other consoles and reach an untapped market. And though this honestly didn't work out in the end, it's probably for the better of the gaming community as a whole that this was more accessible for people of all ages. PSX Name Debate the PSX name debate refers to PlayStation fans either calling the console the PS1 or the PSX. The reason for this disparity is because the codename of the PlayStation was the PSX, so many media outlets called it that name at the time. And just like other consoles have codenames, though, it was eventually dropped and the console was always officially called the PlayStation by Sony. And also, until the PS2 came out, people weren't really calling it the PS1. So for a time after the PS2 came out, people just called it the PSX, since that's shorter than PlayStation. Oh, but then later on, they did make this PlayStation model that's actually called the PlayStation 1. And then Sony released this device, which is actually called the PSX, so it can get extremely confusing when you hear that terminology now. People are still divided on this, and the term PSX is still used in the community, especially with regard to emulation. Regardless of what term you use, you have to agree that this whole thing is confusing. I honestly had trouble naming this video for that very reason. 
The dual analog controller is the classic PS1 controller that started it all. Named after its two analog sticks, its design paved the way for the DualShock controller, which really hasn't changed form since. Personally, I think it's a really good controller. It was the successor to this original controller, which I honestly didn't even know existed before making this video. So, for the first few years of PlayStation, there weren't even joysticks. That's crazy. Pizza Hut Demo Discs Back in the day, if you ordered from Pizza Hut, you could get your hands on one of these awesome demo discs. These discs had some awesome demos, from Final Fantasy to Tony Hawk, and remain a fun collector's item. Oh, and you know something cool? Reggie fils our favorite Nintendo of America present, was head of marketing at Pizza Hut at the time, so he actually had a hand in setting this program up. Spyro the Dragon controls programmed by a NASA employee. So, when Spyro the Dragon was in development, Insomniac Games hired an engineer from NASA to help program Spyro's camera while he was in flight. They were having problems with the typical behind Spyro camera angle, which is why they brought this guy in. Honestly, in my opinion, this is more weird than it is a flex for Insomniac Games. Like, how would this guy be better than a seasoned programmer? I don't know, but regardless, it's a really cool piece of trivia. Software Terminated This eerie anti-piracy screen could pop up on your PlayStation thanks to some code called libcrypt, which was designed to catch the use of a mod chip. Oddly enough, this code is only stored on the disk of a few Sony, Capcom, and Konami games, which is why many people haven't actually seen this screen. Banned in China In 2001, China banned the PlayStation 1 and a few other consoles for sale, and this ban wouldn't be lifted until 2014. China did this according to inappropriate themes in some of the games on these consoles, and though the ban is gone now, there are still many games that you can't play in China to this day. Sony's intense fight against piracy With the PlayStation 1 being no stranger to piracy, it's not surprising that Sony fought hard against pirates. Sony had all kinds of measures in place which differed from console to console, but included region locks, checks on boot text, mod chip detection, and more. Honestly, they kind of created the problem for themselves by literally ma making a port that was just gold for pirates on the original model, but especially with home CD burners being as popular as they were, it was just a huge mix of factors making it super easy to pirate this console, which is why it was such a big problem back in the day. PS1 Rare Kiosks like many modern consoles, the PlayStation had some awesome retail kiosks that you could have played back in the day. While many of these get recalled, some end up thrown out or given away, which is how some extremely rare models have ended up in the hands of the public. You can find them, but for a hefty price. Yikes. Notch's Golden PS1 Invitation so, way back in 2013, Sony sent Notch both a VIP invitation to E3 and also his very own golden PlayStation. A few more of these were given out at E3 to VIPs, and while some at least don't play games, they play the boot up sounds of each PlayStation model. It's definitely a cool collector's item. Throughout 1996 and 97, Sony was a WWE and UEFA sponsor, putting out some really cool ads. Interestingly, Sony remained a sponsor of the UEFA and still is to this day. In the gaming world, it's one of the longest-running partnerships. Saturn's Fly Plaything Fly commercial Sega aired this commercial for the Sega Saturn, which took a huge punch at the PS1, where they literally drop it off of a building. This is obviously really disrespectful, and though it's funny now, I don't think any game company would do this today. The PS1 obviously got the last laugh, though, by absolutely destroying the Sega Saturn in terms of sales. Systems can be found in GameStop dumpsters. GameStop dumpster diving is a pretty big and actually somewhat controversial thing. GameStop has, for a while now, and we're talking like 10 years or more, been known for throwing away valuable stuff. 
This includes games, kiosks, collectibles, consoles, controllers, working and broken. Anything that works but doesn't sell or is remotely damaged is often just thrown out. Also, GameStop will let you trade in a game for $1 knowing that you have to use that gift card back in the store, so even if you give them a game they know won't sell, they still come on top because they give you an incentive to come back to the store, so when you trade in that game, they just pitch it right in the garbage. That's one of the many models that could explain how this stuff ends up in the trash, at least. So there are whole YouTubers that exist just dumpster diving at GameStop. Knowing this, it's not a surprise that a few PlayStation 1s have made their way into dumpsters, and there's actually a few examples on YouTube I found that may or may not be real. GameStop might throw away these consoles if they don't turn on right away or require just basic maintenance, or even if they just feel like it. PS1 used in London nightclubs during 1998. In 1997, Sony commissioned this VHS tape to be created for VJs, basically DJs who show music videos, to play in London nightclubs. This lasted for a few years and just shows how crazy and multifaceted Sony's marketing approach was for the PlayStation. Thrill Kill was a PlayStation game that never saw release due to its violent nature and adults-only rating, meaning it wouldn't be able to be sold in many retailers. The project, created by Virgin Interactive, started as a game called Earth Monster based on a Mesoamerican ball game. Developers repeatedly were pushed to make the game more violent, and Virgin Interactive delivered with this super violent game that would never end up published. It would live on in the game Wu-Tang Shaolin style, which is essentially just a reskinned version of Thrill Kill. If you do want to play the original though, it has since been dumped online and it's pretty easy to find. This Porsche GTO Evo 911 was branded by PlayStation and has since become an iconic race car in and out of the video game world. It competed in the Le Mans 24 Hours race and is just a super awesome car. Just listen to the engine. Judge Judy Season 9, Episode 52, which, dang, there are so many episodes of this show, has to do with a student suing her boyfriend's sister for the cost of a guitar and a PlayStation. The Elemental Gearbolt Assassin's Case was a promotional item for the game, which includes a sweet case, a gold light gun, and a letter from the creators, which, interestingly, warns you not to use the light gun if you sweat a lot. As you can imagine, these things are extremely pricey as there were only about 50 of them made. In fact, this version of the game is considered by some to be the most expensive PlayStation game. So, I'll be quite honest, I'm not quite sure what the 1999 concert entry refers to. There have been PlayStation-related concerts before, mainly playing video game soundtracks, but I'm not exactly sure what happened in 1999. If anyone knows, please leave an explanation in the comments. Pilot Approves Controller This entry refers to Norio Oka, Sony president and keen pilot, who approved the design of the PlayStation 1 controller, which was different to flat joypads at the time. Many managers within Sony wanted to keep the controller consistent with industry standards, but Oga pushed for this innovation, saying that the controller reminded him of an airplane wheel. In the end, he was right, and this became one of the most iconic controllers of all time. Illegally Introduced in Russia So, pirated games for the PlayStation were a huge thing in Russia more than most other countries, and there's a really interesting video here that explains a little bit about how that process worked but I'm not quite sure what it means by introduced, so if anyone has any insight on this entry, please drop it in the comments below. Retailers having the PS1 for rent months before its original release in the USA. So way back in the day, it was really popular to rent consoles for like $20 a day, and this was a big thing with the PlayStation 1, but I can't actually find any evidence of stores having them before the official release date. It wouldn't surprise me if this was the case, but if anyone knows of a specific source or example, I would love to hear it in the comments. The Midnight Blue Edition The 300 Midnight Blue Edition PlayStations produced were prizes to celebrate the milestone of 10 million PlayStations being sold. As you can imagine, these are super rare and honestly are a really, really cool color scheme. Again, all these one-off versions are so much cooler than the original. 
Enos Lives. Enos Lives was a PlayStation commercial as part of that You Are Not Ready campaign mentioned earlier. I'll play a little bit of it here. The 2003 PSX is this device, which I mentioned earlier. It's a digital video recorder with a built-in PS2. It's a super weird looking device. It bears no resemblance to a real PS2 whatsoever, but it plays PS1 and PS2 games. And you could connect it to a PSP with a USB. It also has video editing software built in. As crazy as that all is, this thing didn't sell very well and was only released in Japan and lives on today merely as a piece of PlayStation trivia. The Glasstron was one of Sony's first VR headsets. There were a couple of models of this thing, which let you see the TV screen just right in front of your face. It wasn't like true VR and was probably terrible for your eyes. Some games did have specific applications for this technology though, like Mech Warrior 2, which lets you see through a virtual cockpit, which honestly back in 1995 must have been really cool. So in some countries, Russia being a good example, and this is actually talked about in that video I referenced earlier, many PlayStations already had mod chips by the time they got to the customer. The PlayStation honestly is the reason mod chips were created because of the need to bypass DRM, and oftentimes in countries where there were issues with translations or political issues or whatnot, and it was hard to get legitimate copies of games, people would sell the consoles already mod chipped so that you could play whatever pirated copies you got your hands on. I don't really know a lot about this issue to be honest, but there are really good videos explaining how Russian PlayStation games were usually pirated, and these offer insight on the history of this as a whole, but I'm just not too sure about what stores specifically were selling them like this. I think these were people buying from sketchy vendors or stores that just did not exist outside of those countries. NES Emulation Discs Part of the many pirated things in the world of the PlayStation was NES games on discs, which could be played using a couple of different techniques, one shown off here. It's pretty cool that this works, honestly, and it was probably a really cool way to try NES games way back in the day if you didn't have the console yourself. Final Fantasy Detective Game I believe this entry is referring to the fact that Final Fantasy VII was originally intended to be a detective game set in New York City. Though this idea was scrapped and Final Fantasy turned out to be the amazing and influential PS1 game we know it as today, the ideas for this original detective plot were reused for a game called Paradise Eve. CLIO Advertising Hall of Fame So out of nowhere in a perfectly Sony style, Double Life, this absolute baller of a PlayStation ad was dropped. I won't play the entire thing here, but please watch it for yourself. It's really incredible for no reason whatsoever. It would eventually be inducted into the CLIO Awards Hall of Fame in 2007, which, if you don't know, CLIO is like the Emmys of the advertising world. Some models can play Game Boy games. It's true. Some PlayStation models, specifically the ones with the chip slot we talked about earlier, can play Game Boy games using add-ons to the device. It's super cool, and it's definitely something you should try out if you've got this model of PlayStation and some time on your hands. Lara Croft presented as PlayStation mascot in the UK. It's pretty clear that there's a debate about who the best PS1 mascot is, or who even counted as a mascot, and you might be surprised to know that Lara Croft was presented as the PlayStation mascot for a time in the UK. It's hard for her to be considered a mascot now, given that she's appeared on other consoles, but her impact on the PlayStation was pretty incredible, so it's hard not to imagine that she would at least be considered as a mascot for a little bit. PS1 Attracts Bugs don't you hate getting bugs in your console? Like, like glitches or data corruption or wait, wait, real bugs? Ugh, so, so bugs, especially cockroaches, love dark and warm places and the inside of a PlayStation is one of those, I, I guess, and that makes it a good place to be? That's pretty disgusting. Wu-Tang Clan's Controller there was a limited edition PlayStation controller branded after the Wu-Tang Clan, which was sold in conjunction with the 1999 game Wu-Tang Clan Shaolin Style, the reskin of Thrill Kill that was mentioned earlier. 
It's a cool piece, but it honestly doesn't look fun to use whatsoever. Kawaii Sashen, which literally means scary photos, is a Japanese PS1 game that is allegedly haunted. This has to do with its troubled development at Media Entertainment, where stressed devs were put under a lot of pressure and acted extremely strangely. There's a long legend about how this game is cursed, involving its real ghost pictures and real people getting hurt and a huge cover-up by the company which eventually closed down. I invite you to check out this long video explaining this creepypasta type story, which actually all comes from a 2005 2chan post, and not any official source. The photos in this game are obviously all fake, and there really isn't anything special about this game. Though that doesn't mean it wasn't a fun story, and you should read the original post if you have some time. The Pale Emperor Black Discs The Pale Emperor, an album from Marilyn Manson, saw copies released in the format of black polycarbonate PlayStation discs. Art directors for the game commented that this release had a twofold purpose. It was black, which was a cooler look fitting into the theme of the album, but it also helped for anti-piracy measures. Now, if you remember from earlier, the black PlayStation discs literally did nothing to stop piracy, so it's pretty funny that they made such an effort to do this for basically no reason. With that in mind, though, the black discs really do fit in with the album, and it's definitely a cool design choice. It's a very unique piece of PlayStation trivia, and it's the only example of this type of situation that I'm aware of. The console outperformed CD players that cost thousands of dollars. This is totally true. The dollar to sound quality ratio of the PlayStation 1 back in the 90s was incredible. This was back when nice CD players cost a decent amount of money, and the PlayStation, which could play CDs, had similar quality to these super expensive CD setups. The best PlayStation model to use was the earlier SCPH-1001 model, which allowed for audiophiles to use their own cables. This is pretty interesting, but what's even more interesting is that Sony continued to do this with their consoles, as the PlayStation 2, which ended up playing DVDs, served as a cheap DVD player during the time of its sale. It's interesting not that this happened just once, but twice with two separate Sony consoles, though to Sony's credit, they had been making these type of devices, and they knew what they were doing. The PlayStation truck was a semi-truck filled with PlayStation kiosks that Sony used to advertise the console. It's really cool, and they continued using this trend for further PlayStations as well. There's a whole video about it, which I'm playing right now, that can be found on one of the PlayStation Underground discs. Overall, it was definitely an awesome piece of advertising. Wipeout music used in raves and festivals. Music from the PlayStation game Wipeout was used in nightclubs, and you can absolutely hear why this was played in nightclubs. It's a really good soundtrack. Frosty Treats Incorporated vs. Sony Computer Entertainment Lawsuit Frosty Treats Inc. vs. Sony Computer Entertainment 426F3D1001 8th Circuit 2005 was a lawsuit where Frosty Treats Inc. sued Sony over copyright infringement. Essentially, Frosty Treats was an ice cream vendor that also had a clown mascot, and they were mad about the Twisted Metal franchise having similar themes. The United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit would ultimately decide that Frosty Treats IP was not violent, famous, or distinctive enough for Sony to have infringed on their copyright with the Twisted Metal franchise. I can definitely understand why Sony won this case. These guys just really aren't similar besides basic form alone. Steve Jobs presents PS1 emulator in Mac during Macworld and Sony sues. During Macworld 1999, Steve Jobs hyped up the Virtual Game Station, a PS1 emulator created by Connectix. This is an extremely disrespectful move from one company to another, and potentially even an illegal one, which was the opinion of Sony, who quickly sued Connectix. In the end, the court actually ruled in favor of Connectix, but instead of giving up, Sony bought the VGS from Connectix and discontinued it, though by that time the PS2 was already out, not many were actually using the VGS. This is a really crazy story, and I absolutely know this sort of thing would not fly today. Cable that connects to mobile phone. So Sony created this cable named the iMode adapter to connect your cell phone to the PS1. 
Unfortunately, like many awesome things in the video game world, it was only released in Japan. As you can imagine, there wasn't much support for this device, with some games having limited connectivity features. Take this game, Dragon Warrior Monsters 1 and 2, which had a mobile version at the time, and you could exchange monsters between the PlayStation and mobile version using the cable. It also came with this disc that you could put in the PlayStation to send emails, browse the web, and even download emails to memory cards. While impractical overall, this is really cool. We kick off the final tier with abstract Japanese games. There are plenty of abstract Japanese games on the PlayStation 1, like LSD Dream Emulator that I mentioned earlier. There are an incredible amount of weird games on the console, some with really funny titles like Screaming Mad George's Paranoia Escape. This is a really good video if you want to learn more about these crazy games. NO3306.bin NO3306.bin is a Crash Bandicoot 2 ROM hack that is extremely difficult. I'll put a link in the description to this video by YouTuber Aversatrix, who I believe created the hack. If you want to play it, there are links on that video that lead to the hack itself. While I haven't tried it personally, it looks really fun. The original Crash Bandicoot hacked the PS1 system. This entry refers to an episode of War Stories on YouTube where Andy Gavin, co-founder of Naughty Dog, explains a ton of technical stuff behind the creation of Crash Bandicoot. It's a pretty long but entertaining watch, so check it out if you have the time. One of the easiest consoles to pirate. The PS1 is a notoriously easy console to pirate, in part due to the fact that many people had CD burners at the time, and also because this port was literally a mod chip invitation. ZXE-D Legend of Plasma Light is a PS1 game with Toys to Life products like Skylanders or Disney Infinity. The action figures themselves are pretty well designed, and it's cool to see this sort of device to use all the way back in 1996 when it came out. Lost Net Eurose Demos With the Net Eurose putting the power to create games into the people's hands for the first time on such a big scale, Enough games were created that there must be plenty out there that never landed on the demo disc collections or maybe were never published in any print media or websites. Whether these lost games are just works in progress or maybe even full and complete games, there are undoubtedly scores of lost media from the Net Eurose. We can only hope to recover at least some of these someday, and maybe sometime someone will find a cache of old CDs at a garage sale or an old abandoned forum somewhere loaded with lost Net Eurose demos. And if we do, we should treat them with the same respect as lost content from a fully published game, because they're just as interesting and important to the PlayStation community. Promotional video compilation about PS1 sightings on TV. So, in tandem with all of the wacky advertisements and commercials for this console, there were plenty of promotional VHS tapes going around. Some of these tapes had a compilation of sightings of the PlayStation from movies and other media. I don't actually have footage of this specific tape, but most of these tapes have been dumped online, so I guarantee it's out there, and if I find it, I will definitely provide a link to it soon. PS1 is one of the most fragile consoles ever. Well, the PS1 is definitely very fragile. The optical drive is probably the most fragile part known for breaking, but in general, this guy could just wear down. Catamaran We close off this tier, and the iceberg, with this beautiful catamaran named Cheyenne, though she's better known by her former name, the PlayStation. She was built for the 2000 race called well, the race, where boats would sail completely around the world. She was sponsored by Sony and was skippered and owned by Steve Fawcett, who, if you don't know him, was an incredibly well-known and accomplished aviator, sailor, and adventurer who tragically lost his life in a plane crash in 2007. He's an amazing character on his own, and I highly recommend you read up on him a bit if you have the time. The PlayStation would unfortunately have to drop out of the race in 2000, but in 2001, Fawcett took her to sea again and ended up breaking the transatlantic record for a sailboat with a time of 4 days, 17 hours, 28 minutes, and 6 seconds. 
Also, after she was renamed Cheyenne in 2003, she broke the around the world record for a sailboat in a time of about 58 days. Though these records have since been broken, it's incredible that PlayStation has had such a huge impact on sailing history. Well, everyone, thank you so much for sticking through this long ride. I learned a lot while making this video, and seeing all these things about the PlayStation that were, or maybe even sometimes could have been legendary back in their day, was just so cool. It's really interesting to learn where such a successful console came from, and to learn the little details about this extremely important piece of hardware. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I encourage you to subscribe and join the community for more videos like this. I hope you all have an amazing night, and see you soon.